Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trapp Taylor. Our guest today is Lou Gritzo. He's VP of Research at FM Global, and that is where he leads an applied engineering and natural science research team of over 130 scientists, engineers, and technologists for the world's largest industrial and commercial property insurance company. Lou, I'm thrilled to have you on the podcast. Great to be here. So can you start by telling us a little bit more about your personal story of innovation? What led you down R&D and innovation as a profession? I believe my personal story of innovation started really when I was about to enter graduate school. Prior to that, in engineering school, you know, it was kind of, you got the assignment, there was a right or wrong answer, and you had to get the right answer, and you got the right answer, and you did well. <laughs> and and as I was looking at going into graduate school, I, was, you know, I put myself through undergrad school, and I was trying to figure out how I could, might afford being able to go. And there was a National Science Foundation Creativity Award that my advisor, who is the the chairman of the Department of Mechanical Engineering at Texas Tech, suggested I apply for. He said, you know, think of something that you think would be good and and maybe you you should apply for this. So so I did. I I came up with an off-the-wall creative, what I thought was an innovative idea. And I interviewed for it. Uh, they, they, I made the cut um, and, and did an in-person interview, and and, um, and and then I had to tell my story. What was it at the interview? You know how I came up with the idea. Was it my idea? Did I think it was going to work? And and so I'm I'm you know sitting here in, in outside of Dallas, Texas, and conference room full of these esteemed people from the National Science Foundation and. Uh, and, and I had to tell my story, and, and, and I was fortunate enough to get the award. It paid for my graduate work, and, and I think that's really where my journey began. Oh, my goodness. That is a powerful moment to a young graduate student or, or hopeful graduate student. Do you remember how you structured that story or how you built credibility in that group? I remember some key things about it. You know, there's some of those things to a situation that just stick. Um, I remember one of the guys started off kind of with a hard face and he had a a burgundy jacket on (laughs) and, and, and so I was telling him about, you know, how I had come up with the idea to use this laser to affect the way that, that the fluid dynamics of liquid jets and the way they break, break up into droplets. And, and it's, you know, it was, it was the, the question that opened up the opportunity for storytelling is, you know, kind of tell me where this came from. It was an open-ended question, which was mm. great. And, and, and then as I started telling him about it, it's like, well, you know, I was, I was uh, doing, I've always been interested in lasers. It's cool stuff you could do with them. And, and uh, I was, you know, I was working on a project, senior project. And, and uh, I, I thought I could just put the two together. And, and he started to smile. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> he gets it. Yeah, you know, yeah. I've, I've been able to kind of put him in the in a place where he looked at it and says, okay, this this is for real. This is not a uh, script or anything. This is this is actually the way it happened. And 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 that was the way the story evolved. I love that. You know, there there are so many different types of innovation stories or ways to structure your big idea when you're communicating it. And I think there's that traditional 90 second, you know, 10 second opportunity you get to show impact and how your idea is going to address a problem. And then the next story pattern that emerges once you get buy-in in in that first moment, I tend to notice it has more to do with process and credibility. So can you can you make a connection mm-hmm. with the people that you're pitching to and 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 build credibility with them if it's not already there? And sometimes taking them through your thinking and showing how it was interdisciplinary in nature or how you took something from one place and applied it somewhere else in this really creative way, that that can take you to the next level, which is then hopefully right about implementation possibilities and how feasible the idea is. Do, do you see how... A certain storytelling tactics sort of shift depending on the stage gate 
process uh, part, uh, you know, where you're at in the process of sort of coming up with and then hopefully getting to the opportunity to create uh, the product or, or service or, or system that you're designing? The storytelling, I think, changes throughout that whole evolution of, yeah. of the innovation from the front end and the idea to to the tail end or, or when when you're putting it into practice or seek to put it into practice and you've, you've, you're ready to see that innovation pay off. And, um, and, and the one common factor I think between, and you, you hit on it quite, quite early is, is can the person you're talking to put themselves in that position? Is it, is, and if they can, then it becomes almost immediately credible. Uh, it can, can I put myself in the position of, um, in, in the case of my, my graduate student story, uh, you, how did this graduate student candidate come up with this idea? Mm-hmm. Or if I'm on the tail end of the innovation, can I put myself in the position of a customer saying that, yes, I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to buy this. I think yeah. this is cool. I think this is really good. And, and therefore it's going to add value and therefore be a viable innovation and not something that sits on the shelf. That's, I, I think that makes so much sense. I would love to hear some of the innovation stories coming out of FM Global and your teams. Can you share a couple of your favorite uh, projects or uh, initiatives you have going on? So a couple of things that FM Global is working on now um, are first the digital transformation of uh, industrial and commercial property holders and businesses and how FM Global can help those businesses reduce their risk, which is really the whole business model of the company. We, we work with clients to understand and reduce their property risk or business risk, and then we ensure the risk we can't reduce through engineering. Mm-hmm. And the, the way that we do that in some cases is by looking at the trends of businesses and what are the things that we believe we can do that are innovative and different to be able to reduce those risks or to address a risk that there may be causing that's completely new. Mm. And a couple examples on either side of that. One would be a number of years ago, we realized that we could use kind of internet of things technology to do condition-based monitoring of everything from fire protection systems to key equipment so that it would be very cost effective and easy to monitor the condition of these uh, systems. So in the case of a fire protection system, you know that if there's a fire in the the facility that's gonna work, and in the case of a piece of equipment, you know that something's maybe not going so well, and that piece of equipment may fail to work. So those those kinds of, of concepts have come out of basic megatrends, but ultimately relate at the end of the day for for FM Global as to what's the client story behind it. Mm-hmm. Not only because our clients are our customers, but FM Global is a mutual company. We're owned by our clients. So it all boils down to what's the client story. So if I'm going to monitor a, a sprinkler valve to make sure it's open, How's that going to work for a client? What's the what's the client story behind that? You're going to take Fred, who used to go around and and check and make sure that there's a, a chain and a lock on that valve, and Fred's going to going to be able to glance at a screen and and see that all the valves are open. Okay, so exactly, that's a very yeah. different story for Fred's morning um, from one to the other. Or you're going to take. Um, you know, Sally, who used to go out and, and open up the transformer and take an oil sample and send it off somewhere to see if the transformer was going to work right, to Sally looking on her phone and seeing, oh, well, you know what? The, the dissolved gases in this transformer are starting to get out of spec. I need to think about doing something for mm-hmm. it. So it's, it's ultimately that making it real um, for a client for solutions that we're developing that we would seek then to put into practice to reduce the business risk. 
the examples you shared are so powerful because it, it harkens to how important it is to consider how the ultimate end user may need to be sort of challenged or pushed forward due to the innovation that you're developing. And and there's sort of a, a power of storytelling in that, that you can help guide them to think about this innovation might transform or change forever the way you've always done something. But don't be afraid of that. Here, Here's what that will do to make your, your work life different, uh, but ultimately better. Do you find yourself um, sometimes having to navigate the role as an innovator and as innovation teams of preparing your own users and customers for what's to come in the future? Certainly, there are cases where there's going to be a number of iterations, maybe multiple stories or or multiple exchanges before an innovation really takes hold. And and those may be a variety of different contexts in which you're going to present the end result mm. to a user, a customer, a client, whoever the the ultimate um, recipient or or whoever is going to get the value from that innovation, and then in contrast, potentially pay for that innovation or put it into practice for it to be a beneficial and useful innovation. And and that may take a variety of different contexts and stories, depending upon where that person is, the situation they're in. But our experience has been that the more relevant those cases are, and, and sometimes they may be called a case study, but that's so boring, right? A case study. The more the more relevant they are to the where that person is or that stakeholder is or where their business is or what they're facing the more successful they'll be in terms of of getting beyond the barrier of, well, I really don't need that or I can't use that or nah, I'll never work. That's such a great point. You, you know, it's sort of, to me, it reminds me of the power of empathy. If you're deeply connected to your customers, if you're valuing what they value and aware of what they need, your your innovation is going to be so much easier to translate and and so much more likely to be successful. You know, do you take certain approaches inside of your innovation process that enable your teams to interact closely with users and, and customers? Or do you work closely with account managers? How, how do you sort of ensure that empathy is embedded across your innovation process? So the empathy is a really good point, Katie, and 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 it's you know feeling the pain and understanding the pain. Um, some of the, the the ways that that FM Global does that is the way we roll out innovations from research into our engineering workforce throughout throughout the world, and then ultimately that that workforce is the one that interacts with our clients. And so we will sometimes pilot ideas with clients. Um, again, bringing those engineers that are going to be involved in the rollout to the client and, and people at corporate as well as, as engineers in the field into the mix. Um, the, the overall story, though, really starts with, I think, uh, having, and this is fairly dry, having the data mm. and having done the homework to show that that we believe this is something that's going to add value. This is not a, it's not a made up problem. It's a significant problem. We have the data and, and understanding of the problem behind it. That can be a story in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but then the, the way it gets rolled out throughout that value chain for us is a little different than, than a consumer products sure, company sure. That's, that's looking to do market research or use design thinking to involve their their customers in, in the development of a product. What that makes me think about is, is data and the way that it can sometimes get in the way of uh, of generating buy-in. And in other ways, it can absolutely be the thing that brings everybody at the boardroom table or in the organization to get behind something. How do you find yourselves striking the right balance between sharing too much data or not enough evidence? The right balance of data and I would say situational characterization. In other words, we believe this, mm -hmm. that's the other thing. It, it strongly, it, it, at least it's been my experience, Katie, it strongly depends on, on the situation. Um, it's very easy if the 
the data that are being used are not well understood for it to become a complete sidebar, sidetrack, distractor, detractor, whatever you want to call it. Um, it just, it just, it, it moves everything away from the value of, of the idea mm -hmm. and the innovation potential there to, oh, well, no, nope, that's not quite right. Oh, well, what about A, B, C, or D? So, so the data have to be tailored to, I think, a fairly compact, concise picture of the value proposition of the innovation. And then sometimes, but not always, the level of feasibility. Sure. We believe we can be successful at this because of A, B, C, because we've done we've done something else that's similar and, and we can look at our success rate there or we can we can demonstrate success rate here or we have the right partner that has done some things. So I think that, that when we when you consider putting data out there, um it's gotta it, ideally it, it should be in the context in my mind's eye of the, the, the perfect scenario of the story itself. So this is how this happened. There were questions that came up. We went to the data to answer these questions and the data show us the answer to the question is A mm -hmm. or it's B mm -hmm. or it's this or it's that. Um, data should always be presented from my perspective in the context to a question being asked which then moves it from just dry information to the way to answer a question. Yes, it, it makes the data impactful, contextualized. It helps people activate against it. I, I love every point you made there, Lou. So how do you notice that it, it, is storytelling or pitch practice uh, or communication skills, is that something you talk about much inside of your innovation teams? Communication is extremely important for technical people, innovators. Uh, it's, I'd say, a vital organ. Um, we have a variety of ways that we work to develop communication skills at, at research at FM Global. Every new employee, typically we'll hire people with, with PhDs in engineering sciences or physical sciences degrees. They go through a one-day innovation boot camp. Awesome. Where they are there with their peers, typically other people that have joined the organization within the last six, nine, 12 months. And we have uh, a boot camp trainer that we've worked with extensively with, with the public relations and um, newscaster background. And, and she comes in and, and works them through the basics of communication. They do... Uh, dry runs, they do case studies with each other. And then for our staff whom will require additional interactions either with clients or with interest groups or codes and standards committees or policy makers, mm -hmm. then we have a more extended uh, speakers alliance, speaker training, multi-session course that they go through where they learn some skills, put them to practice over a period of time, then come back and meet again with their, their group and the trainer to review those skills and how they put them to practice and then work on the next ones. So this strategy is, is all based on overcoming the dry scientific communicator syndrome. <laughs> sure. And then also over overcoming the potential for the let's call it training but the uh, development experience to be I sat in the classroom I had a bunch of stuff told to me and then I went back and did things the way I did them before the next day yeah exactly the, the fact that they're constantly building into those skills is it's so critical it, it's remarkable to see the changes that some early career staff have made in terms of their communication skills. Just completely remarkable. From the dry, you know, view graph with data yes. and a bunch of words and a bunch of details to, um, you know, she or he standing up there saying, so, you know, what about this? Um, and we had one staff member that basically 
got everybody uh, very effectively by saying, so I've looked at the numbers, I've reduced the data, and I've decided this is absolutely not going to work and my project should be immediately canceled. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yes. That was a talk that she gave on April Fool's Day. Oh, my goodness. You're kidding. Oh, well, I was about to launch into the importance of sharing failure narratives, too, and having storytelling techniques for, for escalating and killing projects. <laughs> Although that's that's really good trick, too, <laughs> to play on your coworkers on April Fool's Day. Talk about an engaged audience, right? What a way to engage an audience. You know, you, you've published research on the success factors that... Uh, are present inside of uh, of successful research and development leaders. And I loved uh, reading some of your publications on that topic. And, you know, it was interesting that oftentimes technical leaders, um, at least in terms of the way they're perceived by uh, other people in their organizations, they're sometimes perceived as lacking those kinds of skills, interpersonal skills or communication skills. Could you speak a little bit to those findings and um, and why communication and storytelling now have to be a, a more critical than ever to people who are on technical paths and want to rise up into leadership roles? The success factors research that was done uh, in, a, a number of years ago and and uh, published was a uh, comparison of R&D leaders to leaders in other business functions. And so that research looked at how R&D leaders can be successful and how they're measured relative to others that are successful in in the company. I believe the research showed that R&D leaders, because of their technical background and because of just the typical uh, stereotyping that they are going to be dry, they are going to be boring, they are going to be long-winded, have an even greater challenge to overcome that implicit bias to get in the place where they're effective communicators and where they can they can immediately, as soon as the, the discussion starts or they walk into a situation, become not only effective, but in some cases, get over a place where they started maybe behind their peers in another business function. Yes. And so, you know, I think training experiences and and professional development at the moment of entry into an innovation team is so critical. And then those those follow on touch points. uh, uh, When you shared that example of seeing that transformation in a young, you know, in a new hire and the ways in which they're able to share their pitch or their concept in a much clearer way by the end of that training, it reminds me of at Untold, we're oftentimes providing innovation storytelling training workshops, and it can be so uncomfortable and, and such a vulnerable thing to do when a scientist or an engineer stands up at the beginning of the day and, and provides their you know ninety second five minute pitches and to create a safe environment where we can provide feedback and build into each of those people and to see how those projects and initiatives, are transformed in terms of how they're communicated by the end of just one day is amazing to me. But it, it does take a level of vulnerability and a willingness and an openness mm-hmm. to to learn. We, we share a lot of epic examples across industries um, of innovation stories that are powerful and that are that are resonant and that work well, both internally and externally uh, to, to customers, but also kind of creating buy-in internally. I'm curious if you could paint a picture for us of what internal buy-in looks like at FM Global when a when one of your you know creators has a great idea, who do they have to turn to? Who needs to buy in to their innovation story? Internal buy-in can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, specifically within the FM Global research team, um, there's the initial buy-in of the people that are going to tackle a challenge with the mission and of the company. And and it boils down to an objective. We do have open calls for ideas, but even those are tailored around specific business objectives to make sure that they remain relevant. Sure. The buy-in has to be that that's something. Yes, I can see that's relevant. I can see it's important in some cases 
those objectives are well presented in the in the form of a story themselves. Uh, you know, here's the challenge our clients have. Imagine if you're a client and you have this challenge, how would you deal with that? What, what's what's your approach to dealing with that? And and how can we at research within the company, how can we solve that problem? Then there's the the, the typical kind of two pronged buy in, at least from from one perspective of does it matter? Mm hmm. And will it work? Sure. If if it doesn't matter, it, it, there's no buy-in. And if you can't convince me it's going to work, there's no buy-in. Sure. And, and it's and you also spoke to alignment too. You know, if it's not aligned with the sandboxes that we we've sort of strategically set, um, you know, th that at least helps provide a, a playing field or some boundaries around uh, wh what the most critical priorities are for innovation, right? Mm -hmm. Very much so. And alignment's important, but alignment can sometimes be tweaked. I, I yeah. think there's some opportunities to to realign or to align on the fringes. Um, as long as the as long as the difference between the innovation and what's being pursued and and the traditional view of alignment is not too far off. It's still got to be within the broader mission space. What are some of the challenges or, or some of the, the things you would recommend not to do when you're trying to get buy-in for for a, a response or a solution to a technical brief? The, the first thought that comes to my mind on bad advice is pretend that everything is solved. Hmm. Pretend that everything is done. Acknowledging weaknesses or acknowledging soft spots and how they've been considered and been managed is really important. Yes, yes. Yeah, that, that's, uh, again, a vulnerable thing to do, but it's so important to, it, it actually it can be a credibility builder when you say, I haven't figured this part out yet. I need help with this. Or, yes, I, you know, I, I know that this needs to be addressed. I, I'm, I've got a plan to address yes. it, and I, I think it's going to, going to work. And these are the things that I'm going to do. I had yeah. one sponsor in, in a prior function, a prior job that I had where the project w had not gone well. And so I'm going to a, a high level sponsor, basically a high level person in the Pentagon. And I'm walking in and I'm, I've, I've got to tell this person it's not coming together. That's a tough day. It's a, I thought, well, that's where we're going to probably going to lose this one. But that's what we're going to do because that's the reality of it. And we don't want to lose our credibility or integrity. And, yeah. and the story behind this one is, is I presented it. Here's what we're seeing in the models. Here's what we're seeing in the, in the experiments that are being done. They're not in agreement. This is, this is going to be an opportunity. One or the other is going to be improved at the end of the day here. And here's our plan that we're, that we're going to pursue to address this issue. And I'll never forget his response. It was very much of, you know, I sit in this chair all day long and have people come in and tell me how everything's perfect and everything's right. <laughs> and he says, I know better than that. <laughs> I've been there. I've done research. Yes. I know it's not all right. He said, it's, it's, this is good and it should continue. And that was the end of it. That's incredible. I, I um, uh... I'm uh, working with the research team who's focused on brilliant failure out of the innovation research mm -hmm. interchange, and we're hoping to publish a, a manuscript on on the topic, uh, you know, in research technology management. And boy, that's the theme of the entire publication: is can you learn rapidly from things that don't go well, and do so at, at the most uh, reasonable cost you can? And if so, that's a brilliant failure. And you know, I think mm -hmm. there's an element of if you're not failing, then you're not taking risks. Absolutely. Uh, the the traditional mode of failure, I set out to do A and B, and, and I'm not going to get there. I know I'm not going to get there. I've actually kind of encouraged within our own team not to consider those failures, to consider those as learning opportunities and opportunities to morph to something that may even be a greater value, yes. which... It's hard, hard to call that a failure, but, you know, when you look at it from the very beginning point to say, this is where I'm going to end up, it, 
then indeed you're not going to end up there. I totally agree. We need a new we need some new rhetoric around failure. I've even seen some organizations eat failure cake <laughs> when an idea gets rejected or doesn't work out. They'll literally bring a cake in that sort of represents the project and eat it together. And, you know, it's sort of a ceremony (laughs) around it. Yes, yes, exactly. But it kind of creates in terms of culture building, it creates a culture that is willing to talk about it, you know, and and not just be afraid to if we're too afraid to talk about our failures, then we're too afraid to learn from them, too. We're, We're missing out on that learning. I fully agree about the 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 potential to miss out on learnings and and just to to give a specific example around those things in certain areas you see the same problems come up over and over again and and as people change and go to different roles you see the same problem has a tendency to get worked mm. by different people at a different point in time and unless those learnings are documented and there's the opportunity for in for others in the future to go back and review those, the same mistakes or the same path will be pursued. You mm-hmm. basically will be repeating work for an issue that's already been, that the learning's already been achieved in the past, but it wasn't documented because somebody thought it was a failure. Ah, oh, that's right. Yes. So institutional memory building, whether that's documented in writing, whether it's conversational, whether leaders tell some of the same stories over and over to keep that memory alive. It's critical to do that for successes as well as failures. And in order to help, you know, keep everyone on the same page about the directions we need to move in the future and why why we might not ch- choose certain paths because we may have already gone down them in the past. So this documentation of past learnings, also provides the opportunity to build upon them from a different perspective, which could be an innovation in itself. Yeah, that's when ideas come back off the shelf, when you have the opportunity to, um, to, to pull an idea that was shelved and maybe someone new in the organization or, uh, or someone from an adjacent part of the organization or even outside sees it in a different way. And, and wouldn't you know, now it's the right time to pull it off the shelf and, and look at it in a new way. Great example of pulling something off the shelf and looking at it in a new way. Or the other option on top of that even is looking at it in a new way and deploying new technology, which may allow it to be evaluated in a new way or be evaluated in a slightly different way that makes it more feasible. Completely agree with you. Lou, could you offer some advice to innovators as they prepare to convey their great ideas? You've shared so much, but if you had to sort of pick your top Uh, pieces of advice, what would you say? I think the most important thing for innovators to think about as they prepare to convey their great ideas is the three big things. Audience, audience, audience. (laughs) Who are they going to talk to? What do they care about? What are the kinds of things they're most likely to relate to? And how can you present what you're doing in a, in a story that's engaging without leaving big open spaces to get filled in with something you don't want to be, them to be filled in with. And, but with enough detail to where they can put themselves in that place. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that. I love the visual metaphor of sort of thinking about how to transport your audience. And again, it comes back to empathy, I think. And, um, I'm so grateful for all of the insights that you've shared today. I I know that listeners will get so much out of this, everything from creating institutional memory around successes and failures to using an opportunity at the moment of entry for for new hires to to explore and and strengthen their communication skills. Um, This has been such a wonderful conversation, Lou. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you very much, Katie. I appreciate the opportunity. It's it's an exciting uh, topic in terms of how to communicate uh, innovation ideas and innovation value and storytelling is a great way to do it. So it's, it's been a great conversation. I appreciate the chance to discuss it with you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 